Welcome to Digital Health Talks. Each week, we meet with the healthcare leaders making an immeasurable difference in equity, access, and quality. Hear about what tech is worth investing in and what isn't as we focus on the innovations that deliver. Join Megan Antonelli, Janae Sharp, and Shahid Shah for a weekly no BS deep dive on what's really making an impact in healthcare. Hi, and welcome to Digital Health Talks. This is Megan Antonelli, and I'm here today with Samir CT. Uh, Samir is a seasoned healthcare technology executive with over two decades of experience in data analytics, digital transformation, and strategic leadership. Currently, he is the Senior Vice President and Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Hackensack Meridian Health. He's at the forefront of leveraging data-driven insights to improve patient outcomes in healthcare delivery. With a career spanning roles at prestigious organizations like McKinsey, Mount Sinai, Bon Secours, Mercy Health, Samir has consistently demonstrated his ability to drive innovation in healthcare analytics. We are thrilled to have him here today to share the work that he's been doing at Hackensack. Um, hi, Samir. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, Megan, thanks for having me. This is great. Really excited and excited about this opportunity. Yeah. Well, you know, I, we've known each other for a, for a bit. I know um, we've met and we've ha certainly had a lot of folks from Hackensack join us at Health Impact. So I'm so excited to have uh, this conversation. And as I was reviewing your bio, I hadn't realized, you know, what a, an amazing number of hospitals and organizations you've been at. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your your career journey and how you got how you found yourself at Hackensack. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's, it is in fact been a really good journey. Uh, you know, I, I tend to describe my role or, or my journey. And I tried to draw a line when I left financial services and, and joined healthcare. Um, uh, I, st my journey in healthcare primarily started off at Mount Sinai Health Systems in New York. Uh, prior to that, I, I worked for, uh, worked work for Deloitte doing financial services. Uh, at the same time, I also, uh, married an occupational therapist. Uh, who's uh, who's very passionate about being you know being a part of healthcare and making people better, and I think I, I think spending time with her got me to a bit of a realization around why that I can do things I can obviously make a living, and, and at the same time uh, do something that would somehow impact you know the life or or the quality of care uh, that a patient receives. So that, that I think is what what led me into healthcare. I started off in doing EMR implementations. Uh, and then eventually realized and or actually should I say caught myself always looking behind the curtain. Uh, so um, obviously digitization and patient or clinical workflow was 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 really important. But uh, I caught myself always looking behind the scenes and seeing what what data is being generated, how it sits, how it's being used. And that's when I, I, I felt that I should start my journey with working with data and 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 developing developing insights from this data. And that's what got me to uh, to Mount Sinai. I started off in the data and analytics team there, uh, and then and that was my first also journey of starting to move data and analytics on cloud. Prior to this, it was always most of it was on prem. Even there was a, most of it was on prem. But we started to venture with with, with putting data and analytics and insights and dashboards and these assets on the cloud. Uh, so I was there for uh, for I believe almost two and a half years, uh, and then eventually. Uh, saw myself or caught myself, should I say, admiring my own ivory tower. You know, we were given the opportunity to build some assets that were making a difference. And then after a while, I felt that it, it, I needed an opportunity to, to, to look outside of Hackensack, of, of Mount Sinai, and, and start to see what other health systems are doing. In addition to that, I felt that I was always on the execution side of the house and didn't have the opportunity to develop or sell strategy. So, um, uh, I saw myself looking at at management consulting, uh, sticking with healthcare, sticking with providers. But uh, that's when I reached out to or found an opportunity at McKinsey. Uh, at McKinsey, I, I spend the majority of my time focusing on building data and analytics strategy for providers. I did a little little bit of insurance slash pair work, but most of my work revolved around working with provider systems around uh, digital enablement and and data and analytics enablement. Um, I did that for on, around three years or so, uh, but then again, the cycle came around where, you know, I felt that I had learned enough about strategy and it was time to move back into the business. Uh, I, my heart was, was always in, in working at hospitals, 
uh, and and being as as close as possible to to patient care. Uh, again, taking this back to at least you know what I learned from from my now wife, which is uh, which is that you know what's important is the patient. Uh, so that's when I, I I left McKinsey and joined Bond Scores Mercy Health uh, as a, as 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 their uh, chief data officer. Uh, did similar work there. Uh, picked up uh, a few more things. AI was really starting to become stronger and, and prevalent. So so start to learn learn about that. And the other larger piece was automation. Uh, now that's where you know that that, that was a piece of my uh, at least uh, knowledge and career that I hadn't done enough in, but always been around it. So I felt that uh, I wanted automation had to play a big part in at least reducing cost of care. Or, or reducing burnout. So I picked that portfolio in addition to AI, dig, data, analytics, and a bit of digital as well. Uh, so, so that journey was around three years or so again. And then, uh, and then finally, I, I, I joined Hackensack Meridian Health in 2002, until 2022 as a data analytics officer. Uh, so I've been here for a little over two years. Uh, my, my role here is, uh, is broken into four parts. Uh, one is uh, descriptive analytics, uh, which is where we use data and data to provide business or even patients at times, uh, definitely clinicians, with uh, with what has happened and sometimes why that's happened. Uh, the second piece is uh, is uh, is uh, predictive analytics, and this is where AI comes in, which is w- uh, where we build models that starts to early detect or predict things, whether it be for the purposes of running a hospital or treating a patient. Uh, the third piece is, is automation. Uh, this is where we are looking at tasks that are performed by, by, by folks that are mundane in nature and, and, and have an opportunity to automate. So we, uh, we emulate human function. Uh, we also use automation to, uh, to provide patients with more information. So as a part of the delivery of, for example, getting a patient ready for a procedure, generally it was it's some a human would provide information, literature, reading, knowledge, and now we have uh, RPA or robotics process automation provide that. So that's the third piece of my portfolio. And the fourth is software development. Uh, this is where we we do develop some full stack software, but but those are you know uh, those aren't really that that isn't, isn't why we exist as a software development team, but primarily things that bring it all together. Where so we use software development to bring e- either send AI messages across different systems or bring various capabilities together and put it into packet software. Uh, so so that that's what I do at Hackensack Meridian and Health. Uh, wow, so indeed, you know, it's been an interesting journey. Yeah, that is an amazing journey, and it you know I mean I really appreciate you breaking down the you know the, the types of data. You know, we talk about it a lot, you know, the data. And of course, the healthcare is so data heavy and there's so much, right? And, you know, I don't know, I've, I've written a couple, couple hundred session descriptions where I've said, you know, data is the new oil and all this, you know, we talk about it all the time, but to really think about, you know, where it is, where it's coming from, and then what you're doing with it. And the way that you segmented that out is really, is interesting. And then, so you joined Hackensack in 2022, Hackensack Meridian. And so that that was post-merger, right? Um, so it's been, um, you know, I'm sure there, there was a lot of transition. Tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of coming in at that time, um, kind of, I mean, it was, sort of mid pandemic um, and what that that journey has looked like in terms of the digital transformation and the and the current vision. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think the digital or digital enabling vision is is obviously providing patients and, and clinicians with the right kind of tools and asset to to to, to improve outcomes. Right. Uh, and, and also to reduce cost of care. But uh, so, so I think that's that that's the higher vision. In my opinion, I think what what has changed, at least since I have joined, is I, I and I, I do commend my team for this, is that we have become bolder with technology, right? In a safe way, obviously with the, with the right level of governance. But you know, as 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 if you look at the, you know, in the news at at Hackensack, uh, you've seen that you know we have you know our, with our leadership, you know we have, we have ventured down the path of moving things onto the cloud, right? Uh, the reason we have done that is 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 because uh, the business hack and sack, the people we care for, the communities that we function in, demand faster action. Right? Again, within reason, with the, with the, with the confines of governance and you know security and privacy, but it requires us to have the right setup in place. And setup means you know people, process, technology. 
right, to, 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 to action faster and deliver assets faster. So I think what's happened, at least uh, the, the, the change that I have seen is business, uh, our stakeholders, our leaders are more open to change, uh, are, are more open to technology enablement. Um, at least my impression, you know, when I came in, people were still a bit, uh, uh, you know, shy about, about about moving in that direction. Uh, there were definitely uh, ingredients that that obviously led to where we are today, much prior to me joining. Uh, but I think uh, the, the the cloud enablement and making sure that we have the right setups in place to to go faster and deploy faster uh, is, is 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 what is what has drastically changed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that cloud strategy in terms of, um, you know, it's funny. I was just, I just remembered, I think, so I met Dr. Uh, Shafiq Rob, who was the CIO at Hackensack many years ago um, at a conference. We did a conference on big data and it was, and it was, it was early. I want to say it was back like right when Moneyball came out, you know, and it was, and I had, it wasn't my conference. I had taken it over for someone and the chairperson had, um, canceled or something and and dr rob took over and it was like the best and he was so good so that and it is in fact part of my journey into getting back into healthcare and provided provider data and all of that but back then you know it was visionary but it was definitely still hypothetical and it was pre-cloud um tell me a little bit about how that cloud you know how that's evolved and, and where that look what that looks like right now yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and Dr. Rob is, you know, he's been obviously did great work at Hackensack. You know, I see his, 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 his prints all over the great work that was, that was done today. Right. Uh, and, and a lot has happened since then, uh, where, you know, the way I, and again, just taking us back to 2022, you know, there were some attempts made prior to me joining to start to move our data and analytics infrastructure onto GCP, which is Google cloud platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we were able to do starting April 2022 was is to, is to actually make that real. Uh, what that what that means is is we actually deployed the first use case on GCP uh, in uh, June or July of 2022. We gave ourselves 90 days, uh, you know, and and infrastructure was obviously there, right? But we, we gave ourselves 90 days of and and I say 90 days of me joining to to boost, put our first use case in production. Uh, and since then, we have close to 430 use cases in production. Uh, so we've been working really hard in moving our assets, our data and anal- analytics assets into, into the cloud. Why? Because we can do it faster. Uh, we no longer have to wait for servers to be purchased and commissioned. Instead, it, I, at least I, 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 and, and I generalize things. Uh, there are a few other steps to take, but you know, doing things on the cloud is, is as at times it is as simple as swiping your credit card, right? So, uh, and obviously uh, a lot of a lot of foundational work has to be done prior to that, which Hackensack was in the process of doing. Uh, but now that we have in place, when we need to deploy something, uh, you, as long as we confine ourselves to a certain framework, which we have put in place that, is, that has privacy and security considerations, we can deploy really fast. So as you can imagine, 432 use cases within two years is, is quite a bit of work. It would have been hard to do that uh, on-prem and cloud is, is a lot easier. So having done all this and learned so much from moving data analysis infrastructure on cloud, we are now venturing down putting applications on cloud. Uh, so we signed a considerable, a sizable deal with, with Google last year where we decided to move mostly all our applications on cloud and we have many. Uh, we have started to move, move Epic on cloud, and that's starting to uh, come, come together. But in addition to Epic, you know, which is our, obviously the largest and most impactful and important application for, for us here at Hackensack, you know, we are looking at moving almost everything, uh, all the ancillary applications that support our system, that support our clinicians, that support our patients onto the cloud. And I believe doing that will allow us to obviously go to market faster, uh, react better to the needs of the business. Uh, and uh, so, so that's been our journey. That's been our vision. That is our vision now is, is to, uh, to get out of the, the, the business of, of, of managing on-prem uh, 
uh, data centers. Uh, and I say that loosely because I don't think we'll ever be out of the data center business. We will have certain things that will always exist in on-prem data centers, but the intention and the vision is to move mostly everything uh, reasonably onto, on, onto, the, onto the cloud. So it's been a journey. We have learned a lot, and I think there's a lot more to do. So, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. So, so many applications and it sounds like speed and agility is part of, you know, is, is the real kind of driver, but are there, you know, particular examples of use cases or, or, you know, sort of the, you know, elements that really make this like, of course, we're going to take the rest, you know, like, wait, because that, that clearly was a decision. How did that, you know, how, what were the positive outcomes from the, the original a- applications that were moved or the original um, data that was moved that, that drove you to the, to sort of saying, yes, you know, we're going to, we're putting everything. Yeah. Before I answer that, Megan, I want to talk a little about speed and agility, if that's okay. So, uh, uh, so you know when 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 you obviously start to put business cases around around cloud migration, uh, for for good reason, uh, you know healthcare and all organizations primarily are very health conscious, right? Cost is always a consideration. It's something that's always considered. If if you look at uh, the cost of computing on cloud, if done correctly, it is cheaper, right? Uh, while while I say that, it's also imp- every time I have done this, we have ended up spending more but that's not because it's not an apples to apples comparison uh if if you were to look at the same exact workloads on on on-prem versus on cloud yes cloud is cheaper but what happens is as soon as you start to make yourself available to the business and prove that you can put more things in production a lot a lot faster you start to see larger workloads and more workloads so that's the reason what i mean to say is an organization should real organization should realize that yes, you will save money moving on to the cloud when it comes down to just an apples to apples workload to workload. But what's going to also happen is that you will get a larger and bigger demand of of technology enablement. So you'll end up spending more, right? So it's a it's it's a it's a good place to be. But it's uh, you know when, when when I'm asked about whether it will save us money, I say no. It will not save you any money. It will you will actually spend more money, but but the value that you will drive from this is going to be a lot more as, as being on-prem. So I think that's that's important to consider, right? Uh, going back to your question of, of the value, uh, you know, obviously, you know, at least for data and analytics specifically, you know, the value is, is again, you know, apples to apples, what we were maintaining on, on-prem on versus what we're doing on cloud is, 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 is a lot easier. We no longer have to worry about upgrades as, and upgrading our, our hardware anymore. It's someone else's problem, in this case, Google's problem to do it. Our team focuses on the business and being, being in the business of not, not managing servers, but instead being, being in the business of managing workloads that benefit the patient right, and benefit our clinicians. So, so first off, that's the highest value there. Uh, second, we talked about speed. The third is, and sort of related to speed, is is the kind of use cases that we can do, right? Uh, an example that I will use is 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 continuity of care. For example, in 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 the healthcare continuum, is very difficult. This is where we uh, are not able to have insight into into where our referrals are going, right? Uh, at times, uh, while while clinicians. Uh, make the right choices for patients of where they should go for from from a, 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 from one episode to the other. Uh, at times, our options aren't aren't all, always looked at correctly, right? And for the right reasons, and that's because because burnout, because of the speed at which they have to go, uh, that requires a lot of data and analysis. So what we did here is is very quickly, and when I say quickly, is within weeks, we were able to build an asset. You know, on you know, on on GCP that allowed us to consume a very large amount of data, process that data, and provide insights back to physicians saying, "Hey, you referred to this location, but if you referred to Y location, it would have been better for the patient from a continuity of care perspective. We would have we would have kept the patient within the system. That we would have gotten better care, more information. The information would have been contained, and sometimes." For the, for the benefit of the patient, that's not that's that's not the right thing to do, and they are referred out. But such use cases are take time to put together when you think about on-prem, right? And and through cloud enablement 
and not just the servers, but even the tools that are available to us on cloud, we, we were able to spin this up a lot faster. There are various other use cases, especially when it comes down to AI, where we have built AI models and deployed it very quickly and, 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 and digitized the, the, the clinician experience that has allowed us to, is, is to, is to save lives or, 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 or reduce the burden of being in and out of physicians in, in, or in, in, in and out of hospitals, readmissions and things as such by just doing that. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, when you think about the referrals and, and how hard that is to kind of track and, and, you know, and I think it goes back to your, the point you made about, you know, it's not cheaper, but it's better, right? Yeah. I mean, because you're giving these insights and then to some degree, I imagine there are, you know, there's financial be- you know benefits to figuring out where those patients should go versus not go yeah. in in addition to the the benefits for the patients but you talked about how your wife um you know sort of inspired you and said you know it's the patients that matter that's what you brought what brought you back to healthcare so tell us a little bit about some of these other applications um where you know these these types of uh strategies have led to improved patient care and patient outcomes yeah, let's uh, l- l- let's use an let's use an AI use case since I mean since people there's a lot of conversation around that. So you know we have very recently uh, you know uh, deployed a, a product or a capability uh, which which allows us to to uh, to predict mortality right uh, in patients. Um, uh, the reason we do that is because we are trying to engage our clinicians and their families on 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 the thought of if required, as required, end of life care. Uh, I, I went through an episode recently, uh, not I mean, not too long ago, with a family member, where uh, where it was identified that uh, that 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 she would uh, she she should have gone through the, uh, at least the interview with with the, with the palliative care team a lot sooner, right? And but unfortunately, that wasn't identified. Uh, clinicians at times can get very passionate about you know fixing the patient. And they don't want to give up for good reason. And at times they, uh, they, they, they struggle with the signal of, you know, it's time to talk about end of life care. Uh, so we built a capability uh, on, on, on Google Cloud. Um, um, we call it, we, we call it the SICC, which is serious in, in serious endless continuum connect, which predicts mortality and, and it identifies the, or recommends a need for to, to to a clinician, not to a patient, to a clinician, that they should start considering uh, palliative care or or at times hospice uh, for a patient for a critically critically ill patient. That is much needed, right? As you can imagine, uh, it's primarily a nudge. And the way we did this is this is AI plus digital uh, at its best. Uh, not only do we build an AI model that that predicts mortality, but we provide that. Uh, that signal in a way by which a, a, a clinician can a clinician can appreciate it. Uh, what that means is is this isn't an AI application that is or a signal that's provided outside of their workflow. Instead, this is a signal or what we call is a BPA in Epic. So and and the scenario is or or the or the workflow is hypothetically there's a there's a pro, there's a clinician that is uh, that is uh, uh, putting in an order for pain medication for a patient, right? As a part of that, so and uh, you know, a, a, as they put that order in, they'll get a pop up that says, you know, we have identified this critically ill patient, uh, you know, and as part of the model is signaling an X percentage of mortality. You should therefore consider, uh, you know, palliative care or or hospice, and then there there's a meter for that, and then the clinician takes that decision, and if this, and and as soon as he or she says yes, I agree, it creates another order. Right, uh, and we, which would which would then engage a palliative care team to come in and have conversation. So that's where we have we have taken AI from a modeling perspective and predicting capability, and then digitization or 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 making the building a proper digital workflow for and and have brought all these things together. What that allows us to do is 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 increase the need, or should I say, or say increase the flow of of patients. Going to these consult these consulting situations where they're meeting with the palliative care team or a, or a hospice care team to see if that if if that is needed and it's time for that kind of care. Uh, the result of that is reduction in readmissions. You know, we actually did a comparison where we looked at a patient without this capability and a patient with this capability, and it's amazing. It's a startling difference that you see. 
uh, you know, th th this patient that didn't have this capability, you know, died at the hospital within, I believe this was in just a 30, 30 or 40 days of, you know, a, a certain episode. Whereas uh, with this capability, capability, the patient, you know, and then by the way, as a part of that death, you know, the, the patient went in and would have gone in and out of the hospitals as part of readmissions. Instead, this capability would have allowed this patient to, to live longer and then die at home. Right, uh, which 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 would have been preferred. So so th those are the things that digitization plus AI brings in, right? Which is the ability f to provide better care, uh, more customized care at times, and, and then more timely care as well. Yeah, and that's so important. And it, you know, we talked a little bit about this. I mean, in terms of the quantification of value, and you know, that quality of life, certainly at that point of your life, you know, and how you can improve that. It can be sometimes hard to measure, you know. And as a as a numbers guy, you want it to be numbers, but you know, there's nothing. You know, there's no question that you know, sort of that being at home and and being with your family in those times is so important, and easily not something that if the capability and the technology is difficult to get there, you know, if someone said, come, you know, buy this system for X, Y, and we can fix this problem, it might not be prioritized, but the being able to have that agility and speed to do it within the organization because of the foundation you've laid allows you to, to build those things in house, which is great. Um, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, obviously having some on-prem some in the cloud, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, incidents over the, particularly this summer and year, you know, where there's been some security breaches, there's been some downtime, um, redundancy is important. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, what you guys have done in terms of ensuring, uh, you know, sort of security and, um, you know, ongoing readiness within the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Security is key. Privacy is really important. You know, we as you know, I, I in, in some form, I'm a patient myself. My families are patients as well, right? And and managing that data appropriately is very important. So that 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 I think comes before anything. It comes before agility. You know, before it comes before speed to market. And and I think I think that the journey there starts with with putting the rules in place, right? Uh, you know, your you know, my my team, for example, experiments quite a bit but they experiments within confined spaces, right? And there are rules around which, which what we can or cannot do. Uh, so, so I think having a team and a leadership that not only provides, provides the funding, but the aspiration to, to keep data as secure as possible is very important. But there's a, there's a balancing act there between, you know, innovation and being the ability to, 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 to experiment with things uh, and, uh, and 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 being careful, uh, and and that's in my opinion not not hard to do, right? It all starts with building the foundation, right? Uh, it's and, and build and, and, our, and our team has done a tremendous job, right, in putting that together. Uh, you know, Hackensack has invested considerably in setting up security, whether it be on prem or on the cloud, uh, to make sure that is as safe as possible. Uh, redundancy is is an interesting topic. Uh, obviously, us as a health system have to have redundancy, but again, you know, within reason, right? Uh, it, it is uh, so. What we have done is we have built the ability for us to come back online as fast as possible, and then and then and then figure things out from there. Uh, but there are certain situations where redundancy is not possible, right? It's not practical. Uh, so we have what we what we do. Uh, Megan is is we, we we find where redundancy is possible and practical and and where redundancy is not possible. In which case we how do we come back online? How do we make sure that the, the tech becomes available as as you know as quickly as possible? How can we come back into in, in, in we will have to go offline obviously if something bad were to happen. But how do we come back come back quickly and come back safer and stronger? Those are the things that we focus on. So it's it's a mixture of redundancy and and being prepared for the worst. Right. Yeah, no, of course. And you talked a little bit, I mean, just in terms of, as we, we've only had a few minutes left, but, you know, you said that, uh, you you know, the digital transformation process and, and the um, 
sort of attitude has been bold or bolder, which is great. But again, that's also a balance around that. But as you look to the next five, 10 years, you know, certainly with the role of AI and, you know, how, how much easier it's going to make to do amazing things with data. Tell us what you think, you know, what, what we should expect from organizations, you know, on the, on the bleeding edge, like Hack and Hack Meridian and, and others. Yeah. So, um, First of all, AI is here to stay, right? It is not going anywhere. Uh, I think there's been a rapid acceleration of, of, of the need and the ability of AI, uh, you know, uh, for in, in the last year, year and a half, which is good and bad. Uh, you know, what's happened in the last two years is, is I mean, it, it, we've been doing AI for quite some time. The whole world, healthcare has been doing AI for quite some time. I tend to divide this into two kinds, which is machine learning AI, which is what we've been doing all this time, and then now generative AI. So AI is not old, uh, uh, I'm sorry, AI is not new, uh, generative AI is new, but what we'll see is that we will see more and more of both, generative AI uh, and machine learning AI. Why? Because I think the world has woken up to what it can do, right? Uh, and generative AI is responsible for that. Uh, so there are huge pressures on, on our organizations to, to, to build AI capabilities for the betterment of, of, of our clinicians, of our staff, and of our patients. Um, you know, and, and, and by the way, that it, it hasn't just come, come from an aspect of, you know, a few companies did good things. These companies and, and, and their competitors also delivered ways by which we can, we can develop AI faster, right? So a use case, and, and it isn't just cloud. Cloud did speed things up, but when generative AI came in, what also came behind it is these, these things that's called large language models, right? Uh, and these large language models are, is, are things that today that we can, you know, very easily get access to, right, securely. Uh, we didn't have that level of access before. We don't have this. So when we built, when, when my team built models prior to what, ha what happened now, just two years ago, we built our own models. We didn't build large language models. We built small machine learning models, but we never had access to large language models, right? Uh, so, and, and now we do. So as a result of that, we have more AI capabilities. So what's going to happen here, Megan, is that I think the needs of AI will, will increase in the, in the next few years. We as an organization have to be, have to be ready for it, right? What that means is you have to, we, we have to come up with, with making the data available. So these AIs get, because AI functions on large amounts of data, right? Uh, so you have to make sure we are readier with, with data. Uh, we have to make sure that we have the right infrastructure in place to deliver this. Uh, not all AI is safe AI. So we need, to we need to make sure that when we deploy AI within the health system, that it is confined to, to, the, to, to the security and privacy parameters, right? Uh, it's important that we have the ability to govern and, and monitor the usage of how that data is being used. All that is important. So I think, I think in summary, what I'll say is that, is, is that the, the need for AI is going to continue. We have to uh, build up our muscle and our capabilities to make that data available. And it's not as simple as just, just buying AI. It's about building the infrastructure, sending policy, putting policies in place, having the right governance that looks at AI and says, what is good AI, what is not good AI. All that has to happen in the next few years. Uh, you know, we have, we have seen tremendous growth and I, I can see where organizations, if they are not prepared uh, to, to, to manage this influx, are going to suffer. Yeah. No, it's so it's so interesting. And I think when you think about that, sort of the parallel journey that this has all been on, right, with the, you know, sort of the, the shift of focus to the importance of data, the capabilities that the cloud has given us, you know, and the scalability. And now, of course, you layer on AI, generative and machine learning um, to, you know, to, to sort of look towards what's possible. Um, and it's well. It's just a pleasure to to hear what you guys are working on, and and how um, you know how quickly it's been able to, you know. And we talk about how slow things move in healthcare, but if you really think about it, to be able to go from you know April of twenty two to now, where you've got that many applications working towards you know improving patient outcomes and quality of life, that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, definitely. I think for for Hack and Sack, and I'm sure a lot of organizations out there. Uh, technology and ability is no longer slow. 
in, in healthcare, right? We are moving fast, we are moving safely, we are moving uh, within the confines of privacy and security. But I think gone are the days where, where people can say that, you know, technology decisions in healthcare take time. They don't, right? We have, we don't have any excuse. We have the enablement from partners, uh, you know, as such Google and others, right, to, to go at this faster. And, uh, you know, so I think, I, I think, I think technology is, AI is here to stay. Technology is going to move, move really fast and we all have to be ready for it. Right. Well, that's great. It's a great way to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us, Samir, on uh, Digital Health Talks. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and, you know, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing journey. And yes, we do. We all have to be ready. Yeah, so. thank you for this opportunity. This has been great. Really nice talking to you again. Absolutely. So fun. Thank you for joining us for this week's Health Impacts Digital Health Talk. Don't miss another podcast. Subscribe at digitalhealthtalks.com. And to join us at our next face-to-face event, visit healthimpactlive.com.